What is going on guys? So I did a video recently asking you guys to recommend some stocks that you guys wanted to see me analyze, and that video is coming soon, I promise. But one of the top liked comments was for a Canadian EV stock called the Lion Electric Company. Quickly, if you do want some commission free trades on Quest Trade or some free stocks on Wealthsimple, two platforms that I both personally use and stand behind, links to sign up will be in the description or pinned comment. Also, come join the Facebook group where we talk Canadian stocks and a bunch of other nonsense. Link to join that will also be in the description and pin comment. But without any further ado, let's get into it. So I took a brief look into it and I knew I had to do a dedicated video on this one. Like it's an EV company which everybody loves. Well, not lately maybe, but and it's also Canadian. So you might be looking at a stock like this or a company and be like, hey, this is one I can buy in Wealth Simple. It's a Canadian ticker and I can get Canadian exposure to a massively growing industry, right? So a lot of you are probably really excited about a company like this. And that's exactly why I figured I should do a dedicated video on this stock in particular, to explain exactly what not to look for in a stock. So I'll go through the company's financials, their valuation, and explain a little bit about why this is a stock I, would, I wouldn't touch with a 600 foot pole, and how you can differentiate a really exciting sounding new Canadian business from an absolute garbage stock that you don't want to risk putting your hard earned money into. I'll also run it through a discounted cash flow model and we can try and see how much we should potentially be paying for the stock right now to earn a decent return. I really think you guys should stick around to this part. It's going to be pretty entertaining. So like I said, the company is called the Lion Electric Vehicle Company, ticker LEV on the TSX. So Yahoo Finance has it trading at a $2 billion market cap, but literally every other website I found had a different number. So that's great. <laughs> it's somewhere between a $1.5 and $2 billion valuation. So right off the bat, I'm pretty skeptical about this one. I mean, the EV space is becoming so saturated with a ton of startups. The honest truth is that most of these companies won't be here in five to 10 years. Most of these companies are going to go under. They're going bankrupt. There isn't room for all the legacy automakers who are all working on electric versions of their own cars. And then all these new brand new startup companies as well. So right off the bat, I'm thinking things are looking too hot for Lion Electric. Like it's definitely an uphill battle, but apparently this company actually makes buses, not cars. <laughs> Ooh, so let's take a quick look at their website and see what these bad boys are looking like. So we got the electric school bus. F yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at these buses. Only zero emission solution. So they've got a couple different city school buses. I wonder if they make city buses. We're seeing some electric powertrain. <laughs> yes. Look at that. Look how futuristic this is. Yo, you got to buy this. Look at the range. Oh. Wow. Let's take a look at their products really quick. <laughs> oh, they've got like a transport truck too. Now, how many of those you seen on the road? So they've got a city bus. They've got like three school buses. That's probably a short bus. Um, and then they've got this, this truck. Because why not? You know, you're, you're making buses. You might as well be making a truck too. Let's take a look at this one. Man, the Lion Sea. And I'm back on their homepage. <laughs> what? Like their their website isn't even together. It takes me back to the homepage. <laughs> so guys, is this really a stock you want to buy? Their website doesn't even work. <laughs> Before we even get into their fundamentals, you see their little school buses. I think that's just a regular school bus and they just Photoshop their logos on top of it. And their website doesn't work. <laughs> Oh, here we go. There's a working page. All right, I'm done with this. Let's get into the financials. So one of the first things I like to do when looking at a new stock like this is I like to head to the income statement. This is really going to give me, tell me a story, basically, of what I need to know right off the bat. You know, how fast the company's growing, if they're making money or not, and how profitable if they are on their sales, if profitable at all. So this is a really new company. They only actually have a couple quarters worth of financial data. So right off the bat, I'm looking at their income statement, and we're not off to a hot start, like I was saying. Revenue is actually decreasing by the quarter, which isn't a really good sign, obviously. I'd imagine, you know, I haven't done too much research into this company, granted. Um, this is more of a pre-screener. Like, something like school buses would probably be a contract that you'd sign with a municipality. So the sales would probably happen in chunks. Like, no one's going to, you know... <laughs> a school bus company and say, hey, let me buy that new school bus. Like it, it's probably funded by a municipality, by a school board or a city that's going to, you know, purchase a fleet of them for their drivers to drive around to schools. So, I mean, is it plausible that they do have a down quarter after one a little hotter earlier? Yes, definitely. 
But yeah, I mean, with a company this new and trading at a $2.5 billion market cap, you'd expect some revenue growth. And obviously you'll see when we do get into my model that we're going to need a ton of it. We're going to need a lot more revenue growth. So we really want to see this start to pick up. Um, so again, really small sample size, but not the best thing right off the bat. What's really concerning is that they actually have negative gross margins. So gross margin, not profit margin. They do have negative profit margins, but gross margins. So gross margin is your revenue minus your cost of goods sold. So if I sell like footballs or something, my revenue is the money I make from actually selling the footballs to people. And the cost of goods sold is the direct costs that go into making those footballs. So think the raw materials, like the leather I use to make them and the cost I might pay workers to stitch them together. So my gross profit is the money that I actually come home with at the end of the day, just off of selling those footballs, subtracting the cost that it takes to make them. So for this company, it's the amount they're selling their car, their vehicles for minus what it takes to make one of these buses. So that was gross profit. Net profit is the amount of income I take home after all the other costs of running my business are factored in, like things like marketing expenses, admin costs, interest that I pay on loans, etc. So this company is losing money just on making its vehicles before any other costs. So for me personally, if I'm looking at a company and I'm just seeing that, I'm out already. I'm done. Literally, I don't have to see anything else. I'm not buying the stock. Like this company isn't even making money on their buses yet, let alone their you know business operations. They're not even making money selling their buses. Again, really small sample size, really only two quarters. So could there be something I'm missing potentially? But <laughs> guys, it's not off to a good start. So somehow they actually had income in the last quarter despite losing money on their cars. But when you actually look into their income statement, you can see that this income they reported was entirely attributable to other income. So this could be anything, like a gain they recorded on the sale of one of their assets or something. So likely nothing recurring, and it has nothing to do with their underlying business itself, which is selling these buses. And now this is something you really have to pay attention to, because if you automatically look at their net income and you're going to assume this company's profitable right off the bat, when in reality that's far from the case, because their income on operations is negative, which you can see right here. So that's something that isn't too difficult to do. Like anybody can understand that, but it's the little things like this that you really have to actually briefly look into the financials of a company to find rather than just the highlights. And if this is a company that actually has PE ratios, little things like that will actually deflate the PE ratio and look, make it look a lot more of attractive of a buy. I can think of an example of this with Shopify stock. I remember casually looking at Shopify's price and seeing that it had like an 80 PE ratio or something a while ago. And I was losing my mind. If you know Shopify well, you know the thing usually trades in the mid-hundreds of P.E. ratios. Last year, Shopify recorded a massive gain classified under other income, which really pushed their income up temporarily and obviously caused their P.E. to fall a lot, their price to earnings ratio because their earnings increased so much. So to the casual observer, a company growing as fast as Shopify might look a lot more attractive in an 80 P.E. ratio than a 300 P.E. ratio. So they might lose their crap right off the bat and go buy this stock just seeing that, when in reality there's a lot more than meets the eye. And all it took was a brief look into the income statement just to figure it out. So remember, if something seems too good to be true, it just might be. Remember, JP said that. No one's ever said that before. <laughs> and lastly, no big of a shocker here, but they're basically issuing a ton of shares and diluting ownership massively by the quarter. Not even by the year, by the quarter. So basically issuing more and more shares, making the shares that you currently hold in this business worth less and less, again, by the quarter, because now they represent a much smaller fraction of the company as they did before. So there you have the income statement off Lion Electric Company. You basically all you need to know about the past few months of business operations for this company after taking a look at that. I don't even think this part's worth it, but let's go take a look at their cash flow statement and check out their free cash flow, because why not? So free cash flow is a lot more important to me than net income because it factors out a lot of non-cash accounts and gives you a much more accurate idea of business as usual for company. So it's calculated by taking your cash from operations minus any capital expenditures that the business might have. So free cash flow has been negative all year. And are you guys really surprised? <laughs> if this thing were negative because capital expenditures were really high because this is a new company that's heavy, that's you know investing heavily in capital right now. Maybe I give them some leeway, but this is a company whose operating cash flows are negative as well. So normally I'd be completely done with this talk a long time ago, but let's keep on going for the fun of it. I want to make this kind of an educational piece, really tell you guys what not to look for, like I said earlier. Let's take a look at their balance sheet. So the balance sheet is really just a snapshot of the company's financial position at a certain point in time. So because this company is new and obviously losing a ton of money, I'd expect bankruptcy to be a potential threat, a real threat. So I want to make sure that this company is in a strong enough financial position to weather the storm. So they've got enough cash on hand to pay off their total liabilities, which is great because they're, they're definitely going to need it. 
Like if they're not making any money on operations, they definitely better have some money on the side to pay off their debt. But if you add up their cash burn for the whole year, factor in their current portion of their debt, they're probably left with about $100 million in cash on hand at the end of the day, with still $160 million in long-term debt. So I don't know about you guys, but this company is not making money. That smells to me like dilution. So they'll likely make it through this year without going bankrupt and probably the next year, but eventually they're going to have to issue a ton more shares or take on a ton more debt just to be able to survive unless operations can turn around quickly. What do you guys say we put a little bankruptcy timer on this one? It'll be kind of like a funny running joke that we can have going on. Talk about how many days Lion Electric has until bankruptcy. How many days they got left on this planet? I'm honestly giving this company three years max, and even that's bullish. Once interest rates really start to hike, this company is going to be in some serious trouble, especially if their share price keeps falling. Like They're not going to be able to raise nearly enough capital by issuing shares based on their share price if it absolutely tanks. So I'm going to put a little timer on the bottom of the screen here, and we can just keep track of how many more minutes this company's got left. So in terms of valuation, there isn't really much to roll with here. They don't even have four quarters of financial data yet. And most of these metrics are actually measured off their past 12 months. And we don't have that for this one. So we can try and project a little bit of evaluation though. We know they're unprofitable, so they won't have a PE ratio for a long, long time. But if we annualize revenue, they're probably trading at around 50 times sales right now. So they're stupidly expensive and they're probably going bankrupt. The real best valuation metric we can use for an unprofitable company like this is to kind of look at their tangible book value. This tells you how much you're paying for a company's net assets. Like if they were trading at a book value of one with their tangible book value, sorry, you have to factor out things like intangibles and um, goodwill. So if their tangible book value is one and you bought this company today and liquidated it, as in sold everything, you'd make all of your money back in theory. If the book value is below one, you could actually liquidate the company and make a profit. So Lion Electric is trading at six times their book value. So if you bought it and realized that this company is absolutely worthless and wanted to sell everything, you'd only get a sixth of your money back. That's kind of putting things into perspective, guys. That's just their regular book value. I, To be honest, I didn't go through and actually look at their tangible book value. I don't even think it's worth it. I'm not going to waste my time doing that. So let's actually go do a quick discounted cash flow model on the stock just for shits. Just to kind of see how much the stock should be worth today, how much we should potentially be paying. I'll put in some assumptions to see what the stock might be worth right now, and then we can mess around with it and have some fun and see what kind of assumptions you'd have to actually justify its current share price. And then keep in mind, this was a $26 stock at one point. So we'll also mess around and see what kind of assumptions we need for a $26 share price. Okay, so here's my model that you guys all know and love. We can see LEV is currently trading at $10 a share. So here's my assumptions. I've assumed 40% revenue growth. Which in 10 years from now, first off, I'm using 10 years for this model because this is a company that barely is producing any revenue right now. I want to wait till this company becomes a little more mature. So I'm assuming 40% a year for the next 10 years. So based on revenue, that'll have it probably doing about $1.5 billion in sales in 10 years. Now keep in the school bus industry and the bus industry in general is about a $33 billion industry. So $1.5 billion will have it around a you know 5% of the actual industry itself. Do we really think that all school buses, buses in general, are going to be electric within 10 years? I definitely don't. And I definitely don't think this is going to be the only player in that industry, even if they were, or even a dominant one. Nothing's leading me to assume that. So I think 40% is pretty aggressive. Like this isn't, you know, it's not overly over the top. Um, but it's definitely not conservative. There's a lot of assumptions baked into that. Like I think it might take more than 10 years for school buses to become electric. I think it might be 15, 20 years potentially for most of them at least. You know, there might be fleets in like California. Um, free cash flow as a percentage of revenue, I, I went with 12%. Now this is actually very aggressive. Like I'm assuming this company is going to be pretty damn profitable on making their school buses. You look at all these legacy automakers, Ford has profit margins, um, any car company really has profit margins under 10, like between 9 to 5 to even as low as 3% profit margin. So free cash flow as a percent of revenue, very aggressive. Granted, electric vehicles are typically more profitable to make than like gas-powered engines, but again, that's very aggressive. So share change, 10%. Aggressive as well. I think this could easily be way more than 10%. Granted, this company has to survive. And then price to free cash flow, I went with 15. That's pretty high for an auto company. You might be like, oh my God, 15 times free cash flow? Like a, basically a P ratio of 15 for the company that's the future? 
you have to think about automakers really like Ford, GM, companies like this trade around like a 10 to 12 um, P ratio. GM's probably around a 7 P ratio right now. So 15 is pretty high. And then I'm assuming a desired return of 18%. Now I'm going 18 because this is a very risky stock. If I'm speculating on a stock like this, I want to assume pretty high, a high uh, rate of return. I want to reward myself for taking this risk. So all these assumptions put together have this as a $2 stock. It's currently 10. It's got to fall 80 more percent for this to even be a buy at pretty aggressive assumptions. So, I mean, you guys saw the fundamentals. You saw the financial statements. You're seeing this $2 stock. It's currently trading at $10. Got to fall 80%. Who the hell's buying this, guys? Who's buying this? Let's assume what kind of assumptions we'd have to have to actually justify that $10 stock. Let's assume revenues grow at 60%. Okay, it's already seven. And, you know, it's a little more profitable. We'll leave that. Let's just say this has got to be a P ratio of 20, and that's still not good. 20 is still not good enough. So it's going to be a 25 P ratio in 10 years, and revenues have to grow 60% that entire time. For 10 years, 60% annualized for 10 years. What's that going to put us at? One sec. 5.5 billion in revenue in 2031. 5.5 billion. That's like almost a 20% market share of this market. We have to assume a 20% market share of all school buses, not even electric. That's not happening. 60% is not, not happening. You can argue that... Uh, you know, um, the size of the actual school bus industry might grow from 33 billion in 10 years. I don't think it's going to grow very much. How many new schools do you see popping up? The school bus industry isn't going to change in size, it might grow with inflation, but I'm not giving them a 17% market share. We'll put that down to 50, which is still very aggressive, very, very aggressive. And then it's not a buy. We'll bump the profitability up to 15% and it's still not a buy. They have to be making 15% on their bottom line, grow revenues 50% and be trading at a price to free cash flow of 30. And it's still not a buy. <laughs> Let's, what if we want 15%? Then it's a buy. And all these assumptions, which are insane, asinine, are going to get you 15% a year if you buy this stock right now. That's absolutely crazy. So this stock, like I mentioned, traded at $25 per share at one point. $25. <laughs> Should we even like, Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's find out what assumptions we would have needed for this to be a $25 stock. Um, let's assume 70% revenue growth. Oh, okay, that, that takes the cake right there. How much sales would they have to be doing? $10 billion. So they'd basically have to be <laughs> like a monopoly almost, like 30% market share of the EV industry. Let's find out exactly what number that was. 60 with 15 they're not going to be doing 15 percent bottom line we'll do 12 we'll do 13 screw it they got to grow revenue 65 percent have a 13 percent bottom line which is crazy issue shares 10 percent which they're probably going to issue more than that and then still be trading at a price to free cash flow of 30 in 10 years if we bump this down to a more reasonable one for a car company or an automaker, 20 is even very aggressive. And then revenues, 70%. Profit margin, or free cash flow margin, 14%. These are our assumptions. But this would have been a $25 stock. And these alone, which would never happen. This is never going to grow revenue 70%. It's not going to be a third of the entire bus industry. That's only going to get you a 15% return. So if you bought the stock at $25, <laughs> do you feel a little silly? <laughs> Hopefully you can turn this into a lesson and never make that same mistake again. Like I said, I am going to do a video on how to construct this model that I made. I'm actually going to uh, to tweak it a little bit, include some low assumptions and then some high assumptions right beside, just to give us a, bit, a better range so we can gauge prices a little better and compare them together based on assumptions. But anyways, that's it for the model, guys. So I'm not including my buy targets for this one. Obviously, there are no buy targets. Do not buy the stock. <laughs> You might be asking yourself after you saw my DCF model and the assumptions I put into that stock, how the hell it could have been worth $26? Like how could a stock become that irrationally overpriced in an efficient market? That's the thing. Markets aren't efficient. They're semi-efficient at best. 
stocks can become irrationally, irrationally overpriced. They can actually even become irrationally underpriced. But over the long run, these prices are always going to revert to the fundamentals of the business, which for this company is absolutely nothing. But with that being said, that's been my time, and I thank each and every one of you guys and gals for years. I hope you guys got some value out of this one and maybe even <laughs> had some fun watching this. And if you were thinking this might be a good one to take a chance on, hopefully I might have changed your mind. If nothing, I hope it was at least a little entertaining. But appreciate it again, as always, and take care, guys.